my channel at Mayora. I'm Sarah and today we're going to talk together about the American literature and specifically I'm going to focus on one of the most representative authors, Melville. So I guess most of us, all of us have read Moby Dick. There are so many versions, also version for kids and obviously many novels can be read on different levels. But actually the masterpiece, the work itself, is a, um, a very complex work full of metaphor, full of very deep themes and topics uh, and symbols uh, and uh, actually um, there are uh, many many existential uh, uh, themes that we can analyze together. But let's start talking about Melville the man. So he was born in New York in um, 1819 uh, from a Calvinist family and he had to drop school very soon at the age of 19 because of some economic problems of the family. Uh, then he joined the, the crew of a, an English merchant ship and in 1841 he uh, joined another ship actually the crew of uh, he joined the crew of uh, an uh, american whaler now uh, we can start uh, we can start considering now how his experience ha at sea uh, influenced and it was a great inspiration for his works uh, and uh, the metaphors he uses while talking about uh, human existence or human life actually well um this crew uh, this crew of this uh, american whaler uh, sailed on the pacific uh, but actually uh, melville deserted the ship uh, on a polynesian island uh, and there he had the opportunity to get in touch with the population of the place the tapis then, after some time, he ex sometimes, sorry, he escaped uh, to Australia, where he joined actually uh, another uh, whaler, uh, an Australian whaler, obviously. And we can say that by 1850, he was already a very famous writer. He had written uh, um, five books already and they were all based and inspired by his uh, experience at sea. In uh, uh, 1851 he settled uh, on a farm and there he wrote Moby Dick. His fame uh, anyway um, faded quite uh, uh, quickly, quite rapidly, uh, unfortunately, and it revived um, in the 20s, more or less, where, when his books were reread, reinterpreted from a modernist point of view. Uh, in fact, there are many themes uh, and also techniques in his works uh, which are very, very interesting uh, um, from a modernist uh, uh, perspective. Okay, let's uh, try and see what I'm talking about. Uh, first of all, uh, his mature works uh, um, are um, full of allegories, as I said before. So, uh, reality and, uh, and, uh, and symbols and metaphors are absolutely mixed up and intertwined. So uh, everything he writes uh, is symbolic, basically. He uses both a, a first-person narrator and a third-person narrator, so an omniscient narrator. Uh, and for this reason also his techniques change a lot. He uh, uses soliloquies, which are typical of the modernist literature, on the other side, he also uses uh, um, quite dramatic dialogues and asides. Uh, the language, uh, um, well, um, it shifts also from a very high and poetic language to a very colloquial, low, plain language as well. And the, the, the main theme, I can say so, is the quest of the man's place, okay? man's place in the universe, a universe where God is absent, basically. And why uh, can we say that God is absent? Because of the fact that the evil exists. That's the point. So, for this reason, there is no faith. No faith to provide um, 
a code of an ethical uh, behavior. And so um, the uh, human response okay, to life, to the difficulties of life, to the fate, is quite subjective. And it is quite interesting to analyze that response, especially uh, when, um, uh, well, uh, especially when talking about uh, disturbed or anyway tormented personalities. All this is mixed up with a very strong satire, especially uh, on beliefs and values of uh, the Western uh, society of the time, basically. Now let's try to analyze Moby Dick. So uh, Moby Dick, first of all, is a work written in first-person narrator, and the narrator is Ishmael. Ishmael uh, sails on uh, a whaler. Okay, this is quite autobiographical, obviously. The whaler is called uh, Pekiod, and Ishmael uh, um, sails uh, uh, together with uh, his friend and her pooner. And there are uh, many different men from many different countries, many different races, religions, uh, backgrounds, so that is also quite interesting. And the captain, the captain of the whaler, the captain of the ship, is um, a hab, a man with just one leg, because the other leg uh, had been taken from, uh, sorry, taken by a whale. So for this reason, um, Ahab's uh, aim okay, in life is revenge. He just looks for revenge. It is quite blind revenge, actually. Uh, when the whale, when Moby Dick is sighted, uh, the fights uh, begin and uh, Ahab, so the captain, is caught uh, around his neck by the line of uh, a harpoon, uh, the harpoon that actually uh, struck the, uh, the, the whale. And for this reason he is dragged into the sea and he dies. He dies along with the whole crew because the, the whale shatters the ship and uh, all of them die, with one exception, so our protagonist Ishmael, who survives actually. Uh, Ishmael, um, well, he looks uh, uh, very educated to us, uh, especially compared to the others, so he can be the only possible narrator of the work, basically. Uh, but anyway, he claims, uh, and uh, this has a very uh, important meaning, we'll see that in a few moments, he claims not to have received a proper education, okay? So he actually claimed to be uneducated and not prepared. Um, anyway, his, uh, his narration uh, his point of view is also our point of view, even if there are also other perspectives, uh, especially because of the dramatic dialogues um, among the men and, uh, the, uh, and uh, Ahab's uh, soliloquies, basically. Well, um, Ishmael uh, has also uh, an interesting name, because this name is taken from the, ba the Bible, and it means outcast which is obviously quite symbolic too. Ahab, the captain, on the other hand, um, is uh, often uh, considered by the critics as a sort of a Shakespearean hero. Uh, what do we mean with a Shakespearean hero? Well, um, I made a few videos about this topic, uh, um, Shakespeare's characters and also the um, idea of the human being during the medieval times and then during humanism and renaissance. Basically, uh, the human being uh, um, was considered as a microcosm inside the macrocosm of the universe. And when this microcosm uh, couldn't keep a balance inside, okay? So there was an element that created sort of a disorder, in, disorder inside the microcosm of the uh, human being, then this disorder caused a major disorder outside, so in the macrocosm of the universe. This is something that we can actually recognize in Shakespeare's 
characters, okay? They basically have just one element that creates a disorder inside themselves. And this disorder then mirrors outside. The disorder, the, the flow in this case, in Ahab's case, is the, the overconfidence, basically. He is so sure that his mission is to fight against the Moby Dick because Moby Dick is the representation of the evil, okay, of a major evil. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, some critics consider him as a, uh, consider Ahab as an anti-hero, but on the other side, he also behaves like a god, actually, and uh, his uh, major sin is to challenge nature, is to defy nature, to defy God, we can say, but obviously this definition is, uh, uh, well, can, well, it can belong or not to Melville. So we can say that his sin was to defy nature. This is something that we have already found in literature more than once, actually. Uh, let's think, for example, about uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Coleridge was a poet and he was a romantic poet of the first generation. Uh, well, he um, talked, well, his mariner actually, uh, the guilt uh, that uh, his uh, mariner uh, talked about uh, was the same sin we're talking about now. Coleridge wouldn't ha have used the word sin because, uh, well, the, the Christian and the religious uh, um, vocabulary and perspective actually didn't belong to him. He talked about guilt. Um, so, basically, uh, Ahab, as well as the ancient mariner in, in, in Coleridge's work, they decided to challenge nature to challenge this divine force that was nature. And the consequence was obviously tremendous, was obviously destructive, was death, okay, in this case, okay. The mariner doesn't die, but anyway, uh, he is cursed somehow. So, um, this is a quite typical um, topic, actually. Uh, we can go back to mythology and we can go back to the idea of hubris, okay, which is this overconfidence after all, and to the idea of Prometheus that decided to um, steal the holy fire from uh, the gods. And actually he defied the gods and he was punished, okay, because of that. For this reason, Ahab is actually punished with death. So, um, another important uh, uh, image to consider uh, comes from the Bible, where uh, actually Jonah decided to defy God also in that case, and he is punished. He is swallowed by a whale, so obviously the parallel is quite uh, striking. Okay, this point. Um, let's go back to uh, Moby Dick for a moment. I mean, Moby Dick the whale. Um, what does uh, the whale represent? Because uh, from Ahab's uh, point of view, it represents the evil. But actually, uh, it is the inscrutability of uh, uh, the universe. Uh, Ahab, the captain, thinks that uh, it is evil, but actually it is nature, okay, in all this, the complexity of nature, okay, in all possible elements of nature. Uh, nature that is, maybe, probably, or not, created by God, uh, but for sure we know that it can't be defied, it can't be challenged, it can't be disturbed. Um, well, um, on one side it is also true that it is evil, because it is cruel, obviously. But on the other side there are elements, there are also positive elements that, represents, uh, uh, that represent sorry, uh, its goodness. 
Well, an, exa an example is the color white. The, the color is uh, obviously, white is obviously a symbol of purity, not just in literature, well, we can think about Blake and so many poets that actually used colors in order to represent uh, um, qualities or uh, moral elements. But um, it is uh, also a symbol in the popular imagery and uh, in religion, okay? So white is the color of purity. But on the other side, and this is a very strong dualism, it is also a representation of death. Why? Because it is the, um, the color of the shroud, okay? And the shroud, that sheet, is obviously a representation of God. So there is a strong dualism also concerning the color of the, of the whale. So, um, back to the main theme, we could resume it like this. We could say that um, it is all about the conflict between uh, man on one side, the human being on one side, and the universe on the other side. Man is represented by the captain, by, by Ahab, and the universe by Moby Dick. The universe is God. Again, this question is, is open, there is no answer, but for sure it is nature, all the possible forces of nature, and the faith, the fate, sorry. Uh, Ishmael, on the other side, represents also the limits of knowledge. You remember that I said a few minutes ago that uh, he uh, complained, um, well, he, mm, he, he claimed he uh, was sure that uh, he hadn't received a good education, even if we consider him well educated while reading, okay, his words, his point of view. Why? Why this claim? Why um, he's complaining about that? Because actually he represents the limits of knowledge. Well, the ways uh, of Moby Dick, okay, which are probably the ways of God, the Christian God, okay, with a question mark here. So uh, the ways of Moby Dick are unknow unknowable, okay, are impossible to know. And trying to interpret them isn't just uh, useless, okay, but it is uh, uh, fatal, okay, it is destructive, it leads to death. Well, as you can see, the, the, the meaning of the work is very strong, very ex existential, quite dramatic, so um, quite different from the adventure we, we just read in the versions for kids. It is very interesting actually to analyze the real meaning of this work. Well, I hope that uh, I helped you understand a little bit more about Moby Dick and about Melville. And uh, if you like this video, please leave me uh, a like, a uh, thumbs up, as I usually say. And uh, it's, it's always very important for me to receive your feedback and to know uh, what you actually appreciate the most, so I can work specific, specifically on that. Um, playlist. This is the American literature playlist, then there is an English literature playlist, there is an English grammar playlist, the Italian language playlist. We have so many courses on this channel, so it is important for me to receive your feedback. And obviously, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do it and remember to click on the bell to receive notification from the channel. Thank you so very much for following, thank you so very much for your support, and see you again very soon with the American Literature too. Bye!